to the lesson on YouTube. I have really enjoyed listening to the prayers of our prayer ministry in this class. Lyndon, thank you for your prayers. Kathy, thank you for your prayers. They're, they're wonderful. Um, I would like, before Chase sits down, to invite Chase to come up here a minute. And um, Chase rescued me this week two times because my computer uh, didn't, I don't know what it wasn't doing, but it took him all of 10 minutes each time to come fix my computer. And he was gracious to do it. And he's, he's the one who puts our lessons on YouTube every Sunday. He's here faithfully. And, and Chase, we just are so thankful for you and for your ministry to our class. So I made you a little appreciation certificate for your faithfulness to our class. And it says here, we give thanks to God always for Chase. Thank you, Chase. Is that five dollars you get across the that's a bookmarker. It's a magic, uh, a magnetic bookmarker. You found it. Oh, you did. No, this is something else. Real. All right. Have to make do. Thank you, sweetheart. We love you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for all of your help this morning. Let's recite together the Shema. By the way. Someone said to me the other day, Shema, y'all. <laughs> and I really appreciated that because I know that person was, what? Listening. All right, let's read. The Shema. It means to what? Hear. hear. The first word in Hebrew is hear. It means to listen, to act, to be obedient. Ready? Let's recite it. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And Jesus said this is the first and the greatest commandment. So that's, I'm glad we're learning that. <sighs> okay, we're looking at Zechariah's eight night visions. Tim? Listen carefully. Christ is risen. He is risen and today we're looking at the second vision of Zechariah. He had eight night visions. Um, they occurred in the time that the people had begun again to rebuild the temple. Scholars say that these visions, even though it's not explicit in the scriptures, but they are saying that this, these visions occurred in all of one night. In fact, the interpreting angel that we'll be studying again was, had to keep awakening him to receive the next vision. We are studying last week and this week and next week the first three visions. And those three visions were, had the purpose of encouraging the people. And here's what God wanted them to know in these messages from him. That God has not forgotten his people. That God will have mercy on Jerusalem. He is going to prosper Jerusalem. And when people look at Jerusalem, they're going to say, this is truly God's chosen city. Now that's not ha been completely fulfilled, has it? But it was a great encouragement to the people of Judah. So let's look at, oh, looking at why we should study these visions. Because people have told me, why are you spending time in the Old Testament? Why are you spending time studying these, quote, dusty little uh, prophetic books that nobody reads? Well, the, one of the reasons is this, is that they are part of the whole counsel of God. They are part of His will. They give us His purpose and His plan. And they are part of, as I was saying, His eternal plan uh, that God has not forgotten Judah. And so if you want to get a preview of the visions, I had passed out to all of you again if you wanted it page 57 and it has the picture of the visions that he got 
And so if you don't, if you need that paper, be sure and uh, get it in the back. So we have looked at the first vision last week, and it was Zechariah chapter 1, the man among what? The myrtle trees. And we saw there that one of the things that um, we learned was that God has angel messengers that go throughout the earth to see what's happening. And they report back to God what's happening. And these people reported back to God that the world was at peace and at rest. Martha? No, they're not crepe myrtles. That's a good question, but they're not. In fact, myrtle in the word Hebrew means Esther. So Esther, Queen Esther, her name meant um, myrtle, but it wasn't that. Today, pardon? I don't know, but you can Google that. But the myrtle trees were one of the trees that they used for the branches in the in the roof of the of the uh, of their uh, little of their tabernacles, the feast of the tabernacles. They used the myrtle bush uh, limbs as part of the roof of that. So today we're looking at Zechariah one. 18 through 21, it's only four verses and we're going to go all over the Bible today. Because if you, it, to understand this vision, you've got to go back in earlier prophecies. So Zechariah 1, we're looking at this one and it's called the Four Horns and the Four Craftsmen. And when we think of craftsmen, the scriptures quite often use, instead of the word craftsman, they'll use the word smith, who is a, an artisan, or they will also use the word carpenter. So we're going to look at four horns and four carpenters. And it's quite an amazing prophecy. When I was a little girl, I don't know what is wrong with this, Lyndon, but it's not helping me. When I was a little girl, uh, I grew up on a farm and we had cows and chickens and dogs and rabbits and guineas. And my dad would spend early spring dehorning the cows. And it was always a horrible experience for me, so I didn't get close to the barn. But the reason that he dehorned the cows was to keep people safe. Because a cow, if you want to turn that light down a little bit, uh, Doug, you can see the horns on these cows. They're very dangerous. And so they dehorned the cows. And they would dehorn or debud the little calves. And it was painful. Oh, you know about it, don't you? All too well. And um, Bill, do they give the animals any anesthetic when they do that? Doesn't it hurt? Sure it hurts. It's not like my dad always comforted me and he said it's like cutting off a fingernail. I said, well, why do they bleed then, you know? But uh, he, so dehorning. So you're going to say, well, what in the world does dehorning have to do with the horns and the craftsmen? And I will show you. So many times in Scripture... The prophecies are given in code. Okay, we can do the lights now, Doug. Thank you. Uh, and, and the reason they were given in code was because many of the times when prophecies were given, the people were in exile or in slavery or under the uh, oppression of a foreign nation. So the prophets would use codes. And the Jews understood the codes, but their enemies didn't. In fact, when they would read a prophecy like this of the horns and the craftsmen, it sounded like foolishness to them. But the Jews understood it. So Zechariah, when he received these visions, also needed an interpretation, and he had what is called an interpreting angel. And we will meet again that interpreting angel. And you and I need someone to interpret this as well, don't we? So that's why God gave you a teacher. And I thank God that he said, would I do it? And so 
Uh, thank you for letting me be your teacher and help you understand these prophecies. Horns. We've learned this when we studied Daniel. Horns represent kings or nations or their armies that oppress other people, <coughs> other nations. So the horns represent the Gentile kings or the nations in their armies which have scattered and oppressed Judah. So when we read in Daniel about this horrible, dreadful, dreadful beast that had ten horns, we know that somehow or another there are ten nations associated with that terrible kingdom. And we just have to keep studying to find out. Um, other words for horns, or for Judah, I'm sorry. Other words for Judah. Some people get really confused, and I just want you to understand this, is that when we speak of Judah, we're speaking many times of God's people, the nation of Judah, the southern nation of Judah. Sometimes it's called Israel. Israel can have many meanings. It can mean the man Jacob was named Israel. It could mean his 12 sons, which turned into 12 tribes. It could mean the nation of Judah, of Israel. Today, it's Israel. And when God speaks of Israel in the Bible, I believe with all of my heart that he is referring to the land that is called Israel today in that area, even a greater part of, of the land. And he's speaking of his people. God is not through with Israel. And that is why we must study the scriptures because he's going to tell us what is coming, going to happen in the future. So the craftsmen in the scriptures, and this is what we're going to find, that the craftsmen are also called smiths, which is an artisan, a person who works with his hands and makes beautiful things. Or it could be a carpenter. And the, and the craftsmen in the scriptures represent those Gentile nations uh, which defeat or cast down the horns, the oppressive nations. All right? So we have the horn, the oppressive nation. Then we have a craftsman who, who defeats that oppressive nation. Okay. So God, we're going to find, is going to vindicate his people, meaning he might take revenge for his people. Zechariah chapter 1. <laughs> That's supposed to be a 1 up there. Verses 18 through 21. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Zechariah. It's the next to the last book of the Old Testament. Amy, who's this man with you? Okay, I forgot. I forgot. You're not with. What is your name? Robert. Robert. I just met you earlier. Amy, stand up. This is Amy, but her name is no longer Amy. Uh, what was your first other? What? Weikert. Today it's Easter. Her daddy adopted her. She's a new adopted little girl. Look at that face. We're so happy for you, sweetheart. <laughs> We've been missing you too. So you got your notes ready? You have your notes? All right. Got your pencil? Good student. Zechariah 1, verses 18 through 21. I hope everybody has turned to that. It's the next to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah is speaking. And he says, I looked up, and there before me were what? Four horns. And so I have a picture of four horns. I think you better get the lights, and we'll keep the lights off for a minute. There before me were four horns. Now, I just wonder what, the, what that really looked like. Uh, I, I liked this artist's rendition of the four horns. And I asked the angel who was speaking to me, and we call that angel the interpreting angel last week. And he says, what are these? That's a good question, huh? And the interpreting angel answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So these are the nations who have attacked, oppressed, and scattered these nations of the northern kingdom of Israel, 
the southern kingdom of Judah and destroyed Jerusalem. Then the Lord, verse 20, then the Lord showed me four what? Craftsmen. Craftsmen, which we could also call them smiths or carpenters. And this is an artist tradition of a craftsman. And he says, uh, I asked, what are they, these craftsmen coming to do? And the angel answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah. And the, Judah is still scattered today, isn't it? Israel is scattered all over the world. And he said, these are the nations that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. So he's saying the craftsmen are the nations which will come and defeat the nations that have oppressed Judah. Any questions on that? Well, to really understand these prophecies, we have to go back to prophecies that were given earlier. But here's the cycle that the angel wanted Zechariah to understand. And I think, uh, Rodney, you can turn the lights back on if you want to. But here's the vicious cycle. God's people and land are oppressed by a Gentile nation. That would be called what? The horn. Then God will send another nation to put down that oppressive nation. That nation is called the craftsman. Now again, you need to understand that the reason they speak in symbols is because they're trying to hide this from the nation that is oppressing them at the time. So they're now the craftsman is going to dehorn that nation. And then that second nation, the craftsman, guess what's going to happen with the craftsman? Becomes a horn and begins to oppress Judah. So the craftsman that put down the horn that oppressed Judah now becomes a horn. And they begin to mistreat God's people. That nation will then be dehorned by a succeeding nation. And that succeeding nation will then become what? A horn to oppress the people. It's a cycle, a vicious cycle of what has happened to Israel and Judah throughout history. So let's look at page uh, 62, letter A. When, when the people of Judah heard this vision from Zechariah, this is how they understood it to be. In the scriptures, key words are used as symbols of other things. The Jews understood the symbolic meaning, but the enemies would see these writings as what? Foolishness. foolishness. And you know, when you look at this, it would be foolish, wouldn't it? Unless someone interpreted it for you. Letter A, the horns represent the Gentile... Uh, well, let's just put, yeah, kings or nations and their what? Armies, Armies which have scattered and oppressed... Judah, or we could say Israel. Letter B, craftsmen represent those Gentile, the Gentile kingdoms, which are used by God to cast down, defeat, or dehorn, dehorn those same nations which have oppressed God's people. Letter C, here we go with the cycle. But then, in turn, the craftsmen became horns, who then oppressed God's people. And then they are eventually dehorned by the next kingdom coming into power, the succeeding nation. And I call this a vicious what? Cycle. And it would be, wouldn't it? And it's been true for forever. And all you and I have to do is to look at history and to see how true this cycle is. Jesus called this time of the Gentile nations or the uh, horns controlling Israel 
the times of what? The times of the Gentiles. He calls it the times of the Gentiles. And the Gentile nations, according to Jesus, will have dominion over Israel and over the earth for a long period of time. In fact, that time when Jesus said it was like 500 years. Today, it's 2,500 years that it's been the times of the Gentiles where, they're, and, uh, where they have had control and dominion over the earth. Each horn, each Gentile kingdom will rise and rule the world. We know that any time a kingdom in this world rises or a nation, it only has a set amount of time. It will not last forever. Eventually, each kingdom loses power and will be dehorned by the succeeding nation. These times, the Gentile, times of the Gentiles began in uh, 586 B.C. and all of us know that date. In fact, I bet you this group more people in this class know 586 B.C. than more than any other people in all of our church because I say it so many times. It was 586 B.C. when the times of the Gentiles began, when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon defeated Judah, took the king into exile, killed his sons, destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple, that was in 586 B.C. That was the last time in world history that a king from the line of David has sat on David's throne. In 586 B.C. It's never happened again. So that's when the times began. The times of the Gentiles will end. It will end. God has promised it will end. And it's going to end when another king from the line of Judah, from the line of David, will sit on the throne. When, when another king sits on the throne of David, where it will that throne be located? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And when that king begins to reign on earth, he will rule over the whole earth. And even better than that, that kingdom is not going to end. It will not pass away. It will not be destroyed. It will last forever. And so we're going to find out about more about that kingdom. By the way, my class begins Tuesday night at the library. And if you want to go deep into this, we're going to go really, really deep into this. So that's starting Tuesday night. Look at page 62, number, letter A, number 2. Jesus called this period the what? The times of the Gentiles. Thank you. The times of the Gentiles. They will have dominion over Israel and over the earth for a long period of time. So far it's been how many years? 2,500 years and people say God has forgotten his promise. Uh, letter B. Each horn... Or what kind of kingdom? Gentile. Gentile kingdom will rise and rule the world, but each kingdom will eventually lose power and be what? Dehorned. De the times of the Gentiles began in 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon exiled the last king of Judah, killed his sons, and then he, and then he poked out his eyes. The king poked out the king's eyes. He said, the last thing you will see is your dead sons. And that was the last thing he saw. Killed his sons and destroyed what? The temple, the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The times of the Gentiles, letter D, will end someday when another king, king from the line of David sits on his throne, throne in Jerusalem to rule the whole earth. Did I have anything there about like forever? Did I have a blank for forever? Okay. All right. 
For you to better understand this, we need to go back and look at some other prophecies. And the, uh, because the prophecies um, help us understand this. If we don't know these other prophecies, you'll not understand this because it's when God revealed the times of the Gentiles in several other prophecies. In 603 B.C., this is Daniel 2, verse 1. If you really want to know more about this, Daniel 2, verse 1 begins in the second year or the third year when Daniel was in Babylon. That would have been 603 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar had his vision. Daniel wasn't even 20 years old yet when, when he in, revealed and interpreted this vision of the Nebuchadnezzar to, to him. It was the vision of the great and awesome statue. Look at the statue on page 62. That was the vision of King Nebuchadnezzar. And then there was another prophecy that was given um, by Daniel 50 years later. Daniel was now in his 70s when he received this vision. And it was when Belshazzar was his first or second year of being king of Babylon. And it was 50 years and Daniel had a vision of four dreadful beasts. Look at that on page 63. And we'll study that just for a minute after a while. But this page 63, this vision of these four dreadful beasts uh, is the vision of the Gentile nations. Did you hear what I said? This, God told Nebuchadnezzar and he told Daniel, who told us, what these times of the Gentiles would be like and who the Gentile nations would be. And so that's, in, that's what these beasts are on page 63. There's another prophecy 200 years earlier that Hosea gave about the times of the Gentiles. Even Hosea, before Israel, even fell to Assyria. God was telling them that you're going to fall and this will be the times of the Gentiles. And I read Hosea and I read right over that verse. And then I found it. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, Hosea, that I didn't really recognize what this was saying. And uh, then God then confirms this prophecy to Haggai, and we read it, and to Zechariah, God confirms that there will be the times of the Gentiles. So let's look at, uh, oh yeah, these passages reveal things which are to come. God does not want us to be ignorant. And he says, if you know what's coming, you won't be afraid. So don't be afraid. These things are going to happen. And he gave us signs to let us know when these things are going to happen. And we'll study these as we get it through the scriptures first vision is Daniel 2. Now we're not going to read that. You need to go home and read it and come to my class on Tuesday night at the library. But Daniel 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And here is the king, uh, king's statue, an awesome, huge statue. It was great and awesome according to Daniel. Daniel interpreted the vision. He said, the head of gold. So look at your picture and you can kind of look at mine. And he said the head of gold is the first Gentile nation. And he said you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the king of that nation. And what did it, what did it represent? Babylon. So the head of gold. Here's some places up here, precious. Or somewhere. Oh, here, right here by, by uh, Patty. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. The head of gold is Babylon. And then he said, you will see arms and breasts of silver. And in, in his prophecy, Daniel doesn't tell us about the breasts and arms of silver. He tells us that and he says it's another nation. But he didn't know what it was yet. God didn't reveal to him who this next nation was until 50 years later. In Daniel 7 but we know it by looking at history and reading Daniel 7 that the arms and breast of silver was the Medo-Persian Empire and then what's next after the breast of silver Greece. look at your the thighs of brass look at your uh, diagram the he had the thighs of brass and it was Greece and then the two um, Legs of iron was Rome. 
a very, very frightful, very horrendous, dreadful nation. And, um, and then the feet of iron and clay. See, that's when I always got confused. I could follow it, but I didn't know what to do with the feet. And the feet of iron and clay, and here's why you need to think about this. The feet are part of the legs. So it's part of the Roman Empire. But it is a part of the Roman Empire that it has not come about yet. God says that someday the Roman Empire will revive and it will be, and it will be led by the Antichrist. And we're going to study that some more, but you just kind of have to believe me and come to my classes on Tuesday night for the next six weeks because we're going to be studying Daniel 7. That's where it is, and we're going to learn all about that. But the feet of iron and clay is a future revived Roman Empire. Now, when Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar heard this dream and Daniel revealed it to him and, and interpreted it for him, they saw it as prophecy. They didn't know how it was going to come about. But we can look at what they just learned in Daniel 2 and we see it as what? World history. We can look back and see exactly what Daniel was talking about in this vision because it's confirmed and corroborated in world history. If there was ever a time when you need to know that God keeps his word, read Daniel 2. Because we can see how God has kept his word. And he will. And he is in control of history. Let's now look through the lens of history and think about it in terms of the vision of Zechariah of the horns and the craftsmen. The horn. Babylon was a horn, wasn't it? It was a Gentile nation who oppressed the people of Judah, destroyed them, scattered them. And he was, the Babylon was dehorned by a craftsman. Which craftsman? Persia. Persia. All right? Then Persia became a horn, and they began to oppress Judah. That was during the time of when uh, of, of uh, King Artaxerxes, when when he was, or Xerxes, when he was married to Esther and how they tried to annihilate, just literally annihilate the Jews. Persia became a horn. And, but yet then they were dehorned by the craftsmen of what nation? Greece. Greece, Alexander the Great. And then in turn, Greece became a horn. And um, during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek, he oppressed and he put into the temple the abomination that caused desolation. We're going to study that. And so Greece became a horn and threatened and oppressed Judah. And But yet they were dehorned by another craftsman. Who? Rome. In 63 AD. Did I leave out something? Oh, I wish I had a good thing here. The fourth horn. Rome. Rome became a horn, and it was always a horn, was not dehorned. Isn't that interesting? We don't find that Rome was conquered by another nation. It kind of just imploded. And, and because of the internal corruption, it just kind of imploded. But it, wasn't, it didn't die. Rome did not die. It's still alive today in, in the lives of all of the nations in Europe, isn't it? People speak, still, we still speak a portion of that language. And we, we model our governments after Rome and our art and architecture and so many things. We don't see that Rome has died, but it will be revived again in the future. And the person who will be leading this revived Roman Empire is whom? The Antichrist. And so we're going to ask this question, who's going to dehorn Rome? Who will dehorn and judge the Antichrist? You all think you know. Look at page 62, letter B. This is the first revelation uh, that helps us understand Zechariah's image of the horns and the craftsmen. Letter B. The first passage that we're studying is Daniel 2. The young man Dan... Does everybody see where we are? Okay. Uh, the young man Daniel revealed Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
They saw his dream as prophecy. We see it as what? World history. World history. I am so disappointed to hear that so many people in high school don't even need to take world history. Maybe a semester? Are you kidding me? We should be have two years of world history because we need to know what's happened so that we can understand the things which are to come. Right, Amy? So I'll help you with your world history class, sweetheart. Okay. We see it through the lens of world history. Letter A, Babylon was the first what? Horn. Horn. It oppressed the southern kingdom of what? Israel. Southern kingdom? Jerusalem. Judah. Jerusalem. Capital city of Jerusalem. And God raised up a craftsman, Cyrus the Great of Persia, Persia to dehorn Babylon. Then Persia became the second horn, letter B, and was dehorned by the craftsman named Alexander the Great of Greece. Greece. When I studied world history, I wish somebody had said, hey, let me show you how this fits into the Bible. Wouldn't that have been great? Nobody ever told me that. I never even thought about it. All of this happened in the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Letter C. In turn, the Greek Empire became the third horn and subsequently was dehorned by the craftsman Rome. And letter D. Then Rome became the fourth horn the worst and the strongest horn of all. It was from iron. It was, it was the, called the, the iron legs, you know. And their, their army was, were, was called the uh, iron legions. They wore iron helmets, iron armory, iron weapons. It was terrible. And wherever they went, they oppressed and murdered and, and crushed whoever might get in their way. It was not dehorned. That's letter D. Rome was not dehorned, but fell from within because of ter internal corruption. In fact, Rome never what? Died. Died. According to Daniel 7, which we'll be studying at the library, the Roman Empire will what? Revive, Revive and come back together again and be restored by whom? The Antichrist. So my question, who's going to dehorn the Antichrist? Oh, y'all think you know. All right. Now, let's look at another vision of the Gentile nations. This is the four beasts of Daniel 7. Do not take these beasts literally. I remember one time when somebody said, you know, I, I, I thought we had to take all of this literally. And you, this person saw beasts coming out of the sea and quite terrifying. The beasts represent nations. The beasts are nations. And uh, number two on your, in your page 63, uh, Daniel 7 gives an even scarier picture of the Gentile kingdoms because Daniel portrays them as predatory beasts where they devour and demolish their, the other nations. And here is a picture of the beasts. And you can read that. The first beast was uh, like a lion. Now remember, it's not a lion. These are similes. They are, it, was, it is like a lion. And it represents what nation? Babylon. So again, it's the same history, but given to us in a different vision with different symbols. But he adds a whole lot to it. But I'm not going to give it to you today. It's on your paper on page 63. He adds a whole lot to this, these visions. Uh, but you go ahead and say that. But the first one was like a lion. It was Babylon. The beast, uh, like a bear, was whom? Persia. And then the third beast was like a leopard and it was Greece and that's a very interesting picture because he saw this leopard which is a very fast animal had wings of course we would never see a beast like that would we but it had four heads now as you study world history 
It is so wonderful. Because you see what Daniel meant when he saw this leopard with four heads. Because it's just fulfilled in world history. Fascinating. I'll tell you about it someday. Daniel 7.7, 7, we see a terrifying beast. This is the fourth beast. It's a beast that there's nothing like it on earth. The other ones, he said, it's like a bear, like a lion, like a leopard. There is no beast on earth that he could compare this beast to. It was a terrifying and dreadful beast. Lights, please, because this is the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire in its time and in the revived Roman Empire will be like an empire that has never existed on earth. And it had ten horns on its head and a dreadful, terrifying, uh, destructive, voracious, predatory beast. And that was the Roman Empire. So let's look at our notes on number two. Uh, Page 63, the lion is like whom? Babylon. Babylon. The bear is like Persia. Persia. The leopard is like Greece. Greece. And letter D, the dreadful beast, unlike any other beast, represents what? Roman. The Roman Empire. Who? Who is going to destroy this dreadful beast. Who's the, who is going to dehorn him? Oh, you think you know. All right. <laughs> now, look at Hosea chapter 13. And I want to like for you to go to Hosea because it's the book right after Daniel. It is the first of the minor prophets. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Where is my Bible? No. <laughs> It must be on the table. No, I have one. I, I wrote it down here for all you folks who don't, didn't bring it. But it, listen, if I lost my Bible, I have to quit because everything I know is in there. All right. Here's, look at this. Look at this prophecy. Hosea was written 200 years earlier. It was written before uh, Israel was taken into captivity by Assyria. And here's what he said. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. He's talking to Israel and Judah, both nations. He said, I'm going to turn, overturn. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. No, no, no. There, there we go. Hosea chapter 13. Now are we all right? Go back. 13. Now are we all right? Go back. Okay, I'm in Hosea. Thank you, Mr. Wilcoxon. Uh, and he turned it to Hosea 13 so for me. Nice. I'm going to marry you someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we better hurry up, hadn't we? I don't, I don't think you know that yes. He was. This is on YouTube. <laughs> You'd say yes again, wouldn't you, honey? You would say yes again, wouldn't you? To me marrying you. Sure. <laughs> 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 you better say yes. Well, yeah, you better say yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hosea. 200 years before Daniel was written, 250 years before Zechariah, he said, I will be like a what? lion to them. I will be like a leopard. leopard. I will lurk by the path. Like a bear. bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Who was the lion? Babylon. Babylon. Who was the leopard? Greece. Who, they're not in order here. That's okay. Who was the bear? Persia. uh, the Persians. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. That's exactly what happened to the two nations of Israel and Judah. Like a lion, I will devour them. Number four, like a wild animal, I will tear them apart. Look at that prophecy. Is that not amazing? Right there in Hosea. Now let's look. We've read Haggai. Let's look what he says. 
We read Haggai just a few weeks ago. He said, I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. Has God done that yet? No. no. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. Verse 23, there are those three very important words I taught you when we studied Haggai. What are those three words? On that day. That, those words mean on the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ comes back as a judge. And we will not be there and you need to be glad because on that day he's coming back. He's going to overthrow thrones, shatter the power of kingdoms, overthrow all the military. And on that day, I'm going to take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord and I will make you like my signet ring. He gives him the ring, his descendant, the ring that God gave all the kings of Judah. Once again, he's giving that signet ring to a descendant of Zerubbabel because I've chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. When is he going to do this? On that day. All right. Let's look at our... Notes number three, page 63. Hosea prophesied of what? A lion, a leopard, a bear, and a wild animal, all representing those four Gentile kingdoms. Haggai says, on that day, means the day when Jesus, the descendant of whom? But in Haggai. Descendant of whom? Zerubbabel, who is the descendant of David, comes to rule forever. What I just told you is the same prophecy that Zechariah gives, but he uses different terms, doesn't he? He uses horns and craftsmen. He uses those terms, and this is not a good picture, but you have it on your, on your paper on page 63, and it's the same prophecy different symbols, uh, horns and dehorning. The horns are dehorned by succeeding kingdoms. And we could not understand this prophecy without what? We couldn't have understood the prophecy if we didn't know Daniel, could we? Without knowing all of the others. So number five, this is the same, or do you see me on page 63, pet number five? The same prophecy with different symbols. What are the symbols? Horns. horns and craftsmen. No longer beasts. No longer a big amazing statue. It's horns with craftsmen. We see three of the horns in turn become craftsmen. Now look at me and tell me are you understanding what I'm doing with this? Do you understand what we're doing? Babylon is dehorned by, and you can look at that. You can look at your um, at your sim, at your paper. Babylon is dehorned by the craftsmen, Persians. The Persians become a horn. They're dehorned by Greece. Greece then becomes a horn, and it's dehorned by Rome. Rome becomes a horn, but we don't know who is going to dehorn Rome, do we? So do you have number five all fit, filled out? No, one is the 14 of blank will be restored by the blank. What number is that? D. D. The fourth kingdom, Rome, will be restored and revived by whom? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. And who is going to dehorn that nation? Jesus Christ. Oh, you think you know. Oh, <laughs> all right. I've got about 10 minutes. You want me to tell you who's going to dehorn all these kingdoms, this kingdom? Do it. Do it. All right. And so the questions. Who's going to destroy the revived Roman Empire represented by the feet and clay of the awesome statue? Who knows? What was the symbol in that passage? The rock. Good. I'll read it to you. Don't worry. Who will destroy the dreadful beast of Daniel 7? The Son of Man. I'll read it to you. 
and Zechariah 1. Who will dehorn the revived Roman Empire and its leader? Who? A craftsman. But we don't know who the craftsman is. All right. So let's go to Daniel 2. And Daniel is going to tell us who is going to destroy the feet of iron and clay. This is so cool. He tells us so we don't have to be scared. All right. Watch. Daniel 2, verse 34. Now look at your, t at, your, at your picture of Nebuchadnezzar's statue again on page 62 as we read this. Are we ready? While you were watching Nebuchadnezzar, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. So now we see it's a supernatural rock, isn't it? It struck the statue on its feet. So down here on the, rock, on the feet of that statue of your picture, draw a rock so you don't forget. Put a rock down there. Right down, well I don't have it, but just put a rock down there by its feet. Because that rock is going to land on the feet of iron and clay and it's going to smash them. So when a person's feet is smashed or when the base of any statue is smashed, what happens to the statue? It falls. it falls and breaks. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. And the chaff is the part of the wheat that just blows away. And you, and you never see it again. And look what he says in verse 30. Um, Okay, the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge what? Mountain. And it filled the whole earth. This mountain filled the whole earth. Now in verses 44 and 45, it says this in Daniel 2. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. So the statue's destroyed, right? <laughs> and he's going to set up a kingdom on earth that will never be what? Destroyed. Destroyed. It will never be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. What a kingdom this is going to be. Oh. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. This is God, Daniel, telling Nebuchadnezzar, this is the meaning of that rock. It will be a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God, uh, the great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. This is a great book because it tells us what's going to happen. And the whole future has not come yet. He says the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Lights so people can see this rock. The shattering rock is supernatural. It's not made by human hands, so it must be made by God. It's not supernatural. Kingdoms will be destroyed by this rock and scattered as if they were just fine, fine, fine dust or chaff. Here's what the rock is. The Jewish Messiah is the rock. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the rock is Jesus Christ. Paul says in Acts, the stone is Jesus Christ. We did know something. Sir? We did know something. We did. Y'all did know that. And the mountain, this rock that grows into a mountain, is Messiah's kingdom. This rock covers the whole earth. And we're going to be reading about what this kingdom is going to be like. It will endure how long? Forever. So let's look at page 63. Letter C. Number one, God will not his forget his promise to Israel. Number one, Daniel 2, what is going to destroy this beast? Supernatural, 
a supernatural rock. It will come from heaven. It will destroy and scatter the elements of these kingdoms. That's the gold and the iron and the silver and the brass. As if they were what? Chaff. Chaff. Or you can write dust. Letter A, the rock is understood to be the Jewish Messiah. And the mountain will be Messiah's kingdom that will endure forever. Now next week we're going to finish Daniel 7. Who will destroy the beast of Daniel 7? And number three, who is this rock? And we're going to find out. But we know the rock is our Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I would like for us to uh, listen to this song about the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Now all other ground is what? We just learn what is to come. We know that the Bible is true. Amen. We know that Christ is our rock. Amen. And we stand on Him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you that we don't have to guess. But throughout the scriptures, you explain it, and you explain it, and you explain it. Amen. And we do not have to fear. But we do pray, Father, as Jesus taught us to pray, that his kingdom will come. That his kingdom come quickly. Amen. And that his will Amen. will then be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we thank you for that promise. We thank you that he assuredly will come. And we say together, even so come, Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher.